Today's program is called Machini, uh, as most of you Polish folks know means machines in Polish. Um, referring to tractors in particularly, and we have a little introductory film here which we'll see uh, the kind of diversity of homemade tractors are running around Poland. I hope he doesn't pull that tether too fast. It looks like he's going to pull it right off the back of the tractor. It's hard to know quite where to start, so I'm going to start in 1945. And in 1945, as we all know, World War II ended, and the Soviets took over all of Central and Eastern Europe. And they got to Poland, and they had a few dilemmas on their hands. Um, the Poles are pretty special people and had a lot more sort of social cohesiveness, political will, and whatever than a lot of the countries that had been overrun by the Soviets. And the Soviets were stuck a little bit. How are we going to manage this country that really doesn't want us there? And there were several political deals cut, one in particular with a party called the Rural, I guess just the Rural Party, depending on how you uh, uh, translate it. And the Rural Party, in order for being willing to agree to socialization of their country, were very happy to have the land taken, most of the land taken away from the big uh, nobility landowners. They were happy with that, and they were also moderately happy with having a lot of the estates taken away from the church, although that was a little more problematic because the church is very strong in Poland and always have been, and we'll get back to this. But they cut a deal which enabled the Soviets to get agreement by the people to run the country, and that deal included privatization in small holdings by a lot of farmers around Poland. And Poland is the only Central and Eastern European country where that happened. The Soviet philosophy was collectivization, joining up small farms into big farms for efficiency's sake. And, you know, you can agree or disagree with the theory behind it, and history has shown us basically that, that theory hasn't worked very well. But the Poles knew right away that that wasn't going to fly in Poland, and so in 1945, in order to have a peaceful transition to Soviet rule, they agreed to allow a lot of small holding farmers to remain small farmers. And in fact, millions of small farmer ownership was well, were created that didn't even exist before. A lot of peasant farmers had worked on the big estates, and now they had for the first time to, uh, the opportunity to own their own land, and they weren't going to give it up very easily. And the Soviets thought, well, we'll take this uh, short time to gain control of the country and eventually we'll get this back and we'll turn it into the Soviet model. And they started trying to do that during the late 40s and early 50s and it just never worked. The Poles basically resisted in one way or other passively. A, a lot of it had to do with their, their social cohesiveness through the church which uh, resisted it. And they remained small farmers throughout the 50s um, the, the period of tightest Soviet control, which lasted until Stalin died, and then Gomoka took back over uh, in 56, I believe. Uh, Gomoka was, he took over for a while, and then Gierek. Uh, Gierek was the hardliner. Uh, you guys probably know more about Polish history than I do, but uh, Gomoka um, successfully argued with the Soviet Union to allow continuing small farmers to operate in Poland. Nevertheless, Soviet industrial model required um, a planned economy where industrial production was allocated. And what they said is that, all right, we're going to allow these small farmers to exist, 
but they don't fit into our theoretical model, so <coughs> we will not give them any financial or economic encouragement. And in the case of tractors in particular, we have a factory near Warsaw called the Ursus Tractor Factory, and it's making plenty of tractors. But we will allocate them to the collective farms and the state farms, and that will be one of the carrots we will use to have people look for uh, you know, combining their inefficient small farms into efficient big collective farms. And um, if you agree, you get a tractor. You get to use a tractor. If not, you don't get to use a tractor. And they thought they had the whole system solved. What they reckoned without was the spirit of the small farmer, which is the same everywhere around the world. When faced with a need, a farmer learns how to solve that problem. Now, I grew up on a medium-sized farm in New York, and I have all the advantages of being a middle-class American guy with plenty of education and technology. And you know what? It would never occur to me to build a tractor from scratch. But then again, I didn't have to. I could buy all, my father, my grandfather, they could buy all the tractors they wanted. We had tractors on our farm. Now, granted, after a couple generations, or most of those tractors don't look too much like they look like when they came out of the factory. So there was a lot of tinkering going on, as all farmers know. But I could buy a tractor. My dad could buy a tractor. My grandfather could buy a tractor. The Polish small farmer could not buy a tractor. It was illegal to buy them from the West, even if they had enough money, and the government wouldn't allocate them. So they built their own. They went to the junkyards, they found old tractors and trucks and cars lying around from before the war, and they pieced parts together and they built their own. And it's a pretty amazing thing to watch some of these tractors. They do everything a factory-built tractor could do, and in some cases they do it better. You have not just one person, but dozens and even hundreds around the country who independently went out and built their own tractors out of parts they had available, and they're running around the country to this day. Now, the story of today's show, there's um, a Polish photographer named Wukasz Skopski, and he is a professor of uh, art in the uh, University of Fine Arts in Krak Institute of Fine Arts in Krakow, and he has been going around the countryside sort of documenting the sociological and historical phenomena that are available to see today in Poland, and he remembers as a kid, as does his father, going out to this, and this is in the Podali region uh, in uh, southern Poland, uh, uh, just north of the um, uh, Czech Republic border. And um, it's representative of several other regions where the same kind of thing happened, but this is in that, uh, just in that small Podali region, there's a couple hundred of these home-built tractors. And he went and he interviewed the owners uh, and the builders and photographed them in different positions, and he made us a couple of films. And before I go any farther, let's go and let's watch the next film, which lasts about nine minutes. And uh, it has subtitles in English, so I'll just, you know, shut up and let you watch it here, and then we'll talk a little more when this gets over. Było 73-lecie na godzinę kilometrów. Tak, że się tym bardzo dobrze jeździły i praktycznie nie. I wish I had a tractor that would climb a hill like that.
Does anybody recognize what he's making there? He's a bootlegger.
Dobra maszyna jest. Maszosowe biegi 4 i terenowe do 50 km, bo to nasza tu wymiana. Dziękuję. Lewia to jest wszystko do Italia. Tak, już fajnie wiele. Podnią się siłą. Wszystko można. Widzicie, że tu jest wola, całą panią. Bez głupiej, no. To jest taki maleńki, tylko do, do, do pracy do, na razie. No wszystko robił, no. Nawet, nawet może pan wierzy, że i ręki się zamykali u tych. Nikno z tyłu, bym być razem. No nie miał też tam było robił. Też nie przyjdzie mu tu nic. Na chodzie jeden dobry ci skłonny, bo tam stary, strony ci się poręczył. Stary on jest też, stary raz. Tu na tych terenach, to nie jest tu tak bardzo stromo, niby góry, ale, ale my tu te pola mamy takie dość różne. No to jest rewelacja. I traktor się nam sprawił idealnie. Rzadko się zdarza, żeby coś się po prostu zepsuł. Kto przedmiot tu może by i pojechał? Nie tu to to, ale do góry. Dwa na ten bez, tak, że można wtedy z nim wyjechać. Biegi terenowe są to, nie? Czyli na drodze nawet można z nim jechać na jakieś dni. Super, naprawdę. Wspaniała jazda na nasze warunki, to jest bardzo dobry sprzęt. To się dziewczyna lubi. I always have to laugh when I watch this film. There's so many interesting things in there. And one thing just occurred to me today. You know, I know a lot of farmers. I'm a farmer myself. And I don't know any farmer who, if you ask them whether he's going to have a good year this year, will say yes. There's no farmer who will go out and talk about how good a crop he's going to get this year. These guys look more like fishermen to me. Because a fisherman, when you ask him how big the fish is you, you, he almost caught, he'll say this big. Well... One of the questions the artist was asking all these guys was how fast their tractors go. And, you know, you see a couple of them who will say, oh, it's going to go slow. But a lot of them are talking 68. I mean, a tractor going 60 kilometers an hour, that's 40, 35, 30 miles an hour. I don't have a, I've never seen a production tractor that's rated at more than about, you know, 20 miles an hour anywhere. And so I have to laugh every time I see these guys. They're, they're like the fishermen talking about their, their big fish that got away. Anyway, um... Back to the history here a little bit. In the mid-1960s, the um, Soviets were starting to realize that they weren't quite accomplishing everything they wanted. And they had a lot of inter internal discussions on what to do about these pesky uh, Polish farmers. They couldn't manage to put them out of business. Um, they wouldn't collectivize their farms. They were... in despite not being able to um, buy any tractors. Tractors were popping up on the farms everywhere. And then they had another problem. Turns out the collective farms aren't so efficient after all. And we've all heard stories for generations about over in the Soviet Union where they would have the peasants working on a collective farm who had a 20 by 30 plot in the back of their uh, little hut which produced 50 times more uh, produce that they sold on the black market than they would produce in their big collective farms. Well, now they have a whole country in Central Europe that's doing essentially that on a countrywide scale. And it was driving the Soviets nuts. Every other country in Central Europe was uh, effectively collectivized and regimented into you know, big organizations except Poland. And then they started to have a couple of bad years on the farms over in the Ukraine and Russia. And they had to realize that the Poles were feeding all of Eastern Europe on these private farms. And... They really didn't know what to do because they couldn't let the rest of the world know about this. I mean, this is contrary to all theory. Theory is that big farms are efficient and small farms are inefficient. 
Another part of the theory, which goes all the way back to the aberration of 1945 when they had to make a deal with the farming, with the rural party, was that under communist Leninist theory, the people who really push society forward are the industrial workers because they have the technical skills to understand how modern society works and move it forward. In no other country in Eastern Europe, Central Europe, did the Soviets have to make a political deal with the peasants. The peasants were considered the people who did what they were told, and they, you know, the industrial workers were brought into factories and whatever, and they were the ones thought to be trainable and educatable into this sort of glorious future. And now what we see is these peasants building tractors with a lot more technical skill than they ever gave them credit for, and they were solving problems, feeding the whole Soviet system, basically, with skills that they weren't supposed to have, and nobody really knew what to do. Now, as the Soviet era wended its way along, uh, a lot of people started to get fed up with them, and of course we know that in Hungary in 1956, Soviets sent their tanks in and basically quelled the uprising. Now that was an uprising of industrial workers who were politically conscious and understood that things weren't you know, going their way, and it failed immediately, and one of the reasons it failed is because they didn't have the support of the people in the countryside, and so as soon as uh, communications were blocked off, the Soviets were able to starve them out and send them back to work. Same thing happened in Czechoslovakia in 68. The same thing happened in Poland in 1970 when there was an uprising. The 1970 uprising was, was quelled pretty easily because it was pretty much run by the dock workers and steel workers in Gdansk and whatever. And it was a, um, a precursor to what happened in 1979-1980 with solidarity. However, it was done without the participation of the rural communities and the farmers because they were still all operating under the idea that industrial workers and intelligentsia are the only people who could really make decisions for society. So in 1979, a very unique thing happened, and that is that solidarity started to take hold in, um, in Poland, and they made immediate outro outreaches to the rural areas, and they developed a trade union called Rural Solidarity. Something like this was really unheard of. I mean, how many farmers do you know who belong to a union here? You know, you, you think, well, that, that's not what we're about. Unions are for automobile workers in Detroit. We're independent farmers. We, we make decisions on our own. We have nobody to tell us what to do. We're going to grow our crops and sell our crop. But in order to successfully resist what was going on, they essentially formed a trade union called Rural Solidarity, and farmers around the country joined up. And the joining of the industrial workers and the farmers and the intelligentsia in the university and, and whatever made solidarity such a unique phenomenon that the Soviets really had no answer to it. And they didn't dare crack down too much because they needed the food that was being produced. And so for the first time ever, essentially Poland made a successful um, rebellion against the, so the collectivization of the Soviet system. Now, we all know that solidarity didn't complete all of its objectives in 1980 and 1981, and there was another crackdown. But frankly, the door was open, and eventually the handwriting was on the wall. And by 1989, once again, Poland led the way into the breakdown of the Soviet system, and it was solidarity and its union with rural solidarity that enabled an entire country that was running more efficiently than the rest of Eastern Europe to lead the way for everyone to break down the Soviet system. So it's a fascinating story with lots of connections to it, and we realize that you know, our world today might be a little bit different if it weren't for the fact that farmers everywhere are able to sort of solve problems on their own and not just here in America but over in Poland and other third world countries a farmer is a farmer and a farmer is somebody who has to be a little bit of everything a carpenter, a plumber, uh, a mechanic, a welder and we see that story over here in Poland and it's connected to a lot of things in our life now so that's pretty much the story I have to tell you I have another DVD I'm going to play you here and I'm going to speak over it because we don't have a uh, voiceover this time I mean we don't have uh, um, subtitles on it this one's a little bit different the first one the last one we saw he had a couple of specific questions mostly how fast does your tractor go this one they talk a little bit more about how we came to uh, build the tractor and some of the history and I'll be able to tell you a few more things about some of the people we've seen already um, some of these guys are a little more influential in the process, and so I'll read over it. And uh, one thing you can listen to here a little bit, um, 
you guys co probably come um, from lots of different areas in Poland and there's a lot of dialectical differences. This Podali region, these farmers here have a fairly thick accent, which a lot of people I know, I'm not Polish myself, a lot of the Polish people I know can't understand it very well, but it's interesting to listen to them um, because there's a lot of words for tractor parts and things like that that I think you'll find sort of interesting to hear. And so I will try to sort of give you the story as quickly as I can and let you hear as much of their story as, as we have to hear. Okay. He built this tractor in 78 and had to register it with the government in 79 because the police were chasing him all over the place. Bought the parts in Novi Targ, was assembled by Pan Chuzja. Um, we're going to see Pan Chuzja a few other times. He helped a lot of these people build their tractors, and he's one of the influential guys there. 70 kilometers an hour. When I engage the gears, I don't have to use the brakes very much when I'm going downhill. I remember another guy said he could do 60 going downhill. And I'm wondering if that's how slow he can hold it down or how fast he can get it up to. Tractor flipped over in a stream one time. I had to let a neighbor use it. The gears disengaged, the brakes failed. He jumped, tractor rolled into the water, wheels up, jumped out, looked like he was flying into the cosmos. We were looking, are the Russians coming over there? Looks like somebody's launching a rocket. Neighbor went up to pick some hay and ran back when he saw the tractor in the stream. Can we get a little more volume on that, maybe? This was made in the 60s. Pond Chubza made his tractor, too. 78, I was planning it in my head. I made it, and I thought it over. I made it, I thought it over. I was dreaming about it at night, and I made it during the day. So I knew how to do it. Okay, here's the winch. There's a sickle bar mower. Belts that power the sickle. Reduction gear from an old Studebaker. Made in America. Chevrolet gearbox. The motor is a letter Marek. Rear axle comes from a star differential tractor. Polish mid-sized truck, five tons. The wheels are from a Ford. Whole differential comes from a Russian Gaz Jeep. Differentials coupled together with the front wheel drive. This pulls, that pulls. Front wheels are smaller, the rear wheels are bigger, right? So it took a lot of effort to get the differential to adjust the speed because the front wheels spin faster than the rear wheels. Had to figure it out. Front wheels are spinning, back wheels are spinning slower. Okay, the first constructor. They were coming from all over Poland to look at this one, see how he does it. He made a shitload of tractors. For sure he made a hundred. He had some ideas for a long time. He started to build a helicopter about 30 years ago. He got all the parts bought, never finished it. They told him later, work on tractors, not helicopters. You get used to tractors. Where is he going to fly in a helicopter? So he started to work on the tractors. One guy looked at it, he did it, then did another one. Then they all started to build tractors. First had a Mercedes 200 engine. It was too fast, went 100 kilometers. Too fast, horribly fast. It was real scary because of that reason, so I changed to this other engine. Here, everybody went crazy. All of them had to have a homemade tractor. Uh, after a while, two weeks, and they were done.
Those are the years 75, 76. We were making them on a pretty massive scale. Roads were narrow. Standard tractors couldn't fit in there. Made them out of my head. When you make one, you had to think it out yourself. Nobody helped you. This one's about 20 years old. The frame and assembly were bought in Volumomen, put together. It's all taken from a junkyard. Lots of problems like that, but you had to drive back and forth a lot and you finally found everything you needed. We have hilly terrain, so we weren't really able to drive much. This has three speeds, everything worked. Still, doesn't want to go. I guess this one's not running right now. Has three speeds, pulls non-stop when it pulls all the wheels. So what it has to do, no matter what, it goes. In winter, I put chains on the wheels, I can drive it just the same. She can go up any hill. Horse is too expensive nowadays. We have a horse too, but it stays in the barn. I drive my little tractor. I like my little tractor. I take a seat and drive. With a horse, I'd have to walk up the hill with a horse, but here you just drive. It drives wonderfully. I bought this tractor in 76. It was 20 years old by then. I bought it in 76. Since that time, I just drive it. I'll tell you a story about when I bought it. First time I got this tractor from the mechanic, we didn't even know how to engage the gears. Instead of first gear, I put it in third and drove right through my neighbor's fence. Ran over the whole fence. Next day I had a lot of trouble. I had to fix the fence, and I had to give my neighbor a bottle of vodka, and we had to drink it together, and it was all kinds of trouble. <laughs> I had to put it on her table so she wouldn't be upset with me. At first, it was only American parts. The frame was different, but it was too, bu too weak, so we rebuilt it using Gaz parts, an old Gaz Russian Jeep. It could go anywhere. It can even get to my place. I can't drive with the Ferguson. I think he must have a Massey Ferguson tractor there now also. I can't drive with the Ferguson in places I can go with this one. It could pull the load of two horses, and it was excellent for mowing hay because the bugs wouldn't bite us. Um... When we use horses, we had to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning so the bugs wouldn't bite us, and we were not able to finish it even in a day. With this tractor now, we can do it easily in a day. And I'm always dirty and covered in oil and smoke, so the bugs leave me alone. This guy has a sawmill, and he's just opened a new bed and breakfast there, and he's one of the principal guys here. We made it ourselves. When I didn't have my sawmill, I was more interested in manufacturing tractors. I made a couple for my neighbors. Has an IFA front axle. The engine, engine is a Leyland from Andrikov, six-cylinder. Gearbox from a Star. The reduction gear is completely homemade to fit it. I didn't have any training at all, just primary school. Here's the drive shaft, transmits the power to the front and to the rear. I made it myself. I liked these wheels at first, but then after a while I decided I had to do something with them. I don't remember where the winch came from. This one, the drive, yeah, the drive I bought at an auction in Krakow. I made a backhoe and a front-end loader in 1979. It was a big thing in those days. There weren't any backhoes around. Now there are a lot of them. An IFA 60, made in Germany, a 4x4. 180 horsepower engine, Tyler cab. 
We put an HDS crane behind the cab made by Benz, Austrian. We can put sidewalls up on the flatbed. There are six clonics. I don't know what a clonic is. Maybe it's one of you can tell me what a clonic is. It's about 170 centimeters long. So if you put the sidewalls up, you can use it for sand, gravel, coal. You can pull them out using a crane. And we can carry boards up to six meters long in a bed. That one's more of a truck than a tractor, but... This is made on the base of a, a UAZ-63. Used to pull planes in the airport. We took the frame out, put parts in from other vehicles, engine from a Leland and Doria, windshield from a Mercedes, the winch is from a Gaz. DZKT homemade. They're originally made to work in the forest hauling, hauling um, uh, trees to the factories. But they're wide and heavy. Two winches in the front and the back. Plow in the front, ramp in the back, pull the trunks up on. Everything bends in the middle. It's articulating tractor. Or if it were not articulating, the front would lift up when it got a load on it. And this truck goes everywhere he wants. It fits everywhere. Oh, about 20 years ago, from a Dodge. This is an American car, Dodge Key. It was a car. It was totally changed over. Here's the frame. Here are the half axles in the front and the back. Over there, you can disengage it. So, for example, the front doesn't pull if you don't want it to. But uphill, you better engage the front, or otherwise you don't go up the hill. We have hills here. Lots of combinations. You had to think hard to make anything. This tractor is from 1970. God gave 12 talents to one guy, only one talent to another guy. The one who got 12 talents didn't know how to use them. The one who had one knew how to use it. So that's how I built this tractor. It was just enough for me to see and think how I could make it. I was handy enough so I could do it without school or anything. Twenty years ago, fifteen years, it was driving fast, but the gearbox has been changed since then. Now it's got a star because of a reduction, reduction gear from a rover. It was fast. It's too fast. It was losing power and going uphill. We use it on the farm. It was made by Grandpa, Dad. Sit down. Isn't it wet over there? Yeah, it's wet. Well, don't sit. Stand up then. It was Jan Glogutz. He was making tractors, but now nobody makes tractors because they're all factory made. In the old days, there were narrow roads. Everyone had to have a narrow wheel pan, otherwise it wouldn't fit on the road. Today, they buy factory made. It was hard. We had to go to all the junkyards. We did it all ourselves. I had a little lathe and a welder which we had powered by a combustion engine because we didn't have electricity. I was chased by the police. They didn't let us work. We had to give them some money. They took my internal passport, so I had to work in town to get it back. I stopped making these tractors. I had to lie a little because I had no other choice.
Tractor's very fast, but it's not allowed to drive so fast. I got three speeds and a mower attached. Panchuda had a lot of problems with that. He made them on a grand scale, and he even employed a worker. It's assembled from a miller, the tractor on caterpillar tracks. This bulldozer that was also used for loading. Some parts are from a Czech LKT, and some are from a German miller, and they're joined together. It was used as a payloader, backhoe, bulldozer, multitasking. There are many guys who make it this way with their own resources. They help each other if they have no lathes so they can mill the parts. The hardest part is to join the engine in the gearbox that comes from a different car. One guy thought it out, the others saw how he could do it, they improved on it, and that's how it went. Right now, it works very well at the construction site. Repairs like mending dams on the river, it can go anywhere because it has four-wheel drive. I guess he must be working on a, a contract somewhere out of his farm. It can go anywhere because it has four-wheel drive. Worked very well for 15 years without any breakdowns. Three-speed Studebaker. The reduction gear is from a Studebaker, too. Steering wheels from a star. The engine is a C360, which is a Polish tractor. I had to put in a new battery so I could hear better. Because the other one has no juice left. I had a little trouble with that at first. I was looking for the battery on his tractor and I really... First one was from the year 60. To weld it, we had to drive to Molarns because there was no electric power. Today, it doesn't even pay to drive it. It was made in 76. I have a second engine, but it's archaic now, ready to go to the junkyard. Many people don't have a driver's license, especially the old guys, but somehow we sneak around. My son says that these self-taught drivers drive better than those with license, but law is the law, and today everybody has to have a driver's license. And these tractors, the brakes are very weak. You can barely drive, and you have to brake with the gears to go downhill, but you make it somehow. Two hundred and twenty volts, there there's a ground cable. I wound the generator coils myself with my own hands. I wind the coils and the power drill that run off it. It makes me happy. All you see here I made myself. There's a tractor. I made it myself too. The belt powered takeoff wheel, hitch. Everything. We had a little trouble understanding him. We think he was spoofing some of the Russians there. He had a couple of Russian uh, colloquialisms in there that we didn't get translated. Got field gears and road gears. In the road gears, it might even make it up to 60. If you can get it in gear. (laughs) 
Ah, oh, there we go. <laughs> I think I might be scared to reuse a tractor built by this guy. The first engine on this tractor came from a Junak, which is a Polish motorcycle. First, it was made to run on three wheels. Then I changed it in front so I had four wheels. The wheels of the front were tiny from a Mercus. Later, I used an engine from a Varsava car. This is a brand new one. This was built in 2004. Engine was a Sobretsky 3 liter 80 horsepower. Clutch was made out of sheet metal. Flywheel is made specifically for it, partially a ZUK, partially a Mercedes. Clutch disc comes from a C330 tractor, the gearbox from a Russian Gaz bus. Gear reduction is homemade, but partially from a Russian tractor, Vladimirik. Transaxle came from a German truck Robor, and the rear wheels also from the Robor. Russian tires. I made the frame. Radiator fan from a Star 200. That's a Polonaise car. Five kilo propane gas bottles. Oil tank from a Zelska bus. Bus air tank. Three uh, winches from a Star 660. PTO shaft comes off the gearbox. I made that myself. Brakes are hydro hydraulic pneumatic, left, right side, independent. Fuel tank out of a gas bottle. Steering wheel came from a friend of mine. What else? It bends in the middle. Front and rear wheels drive on the same track. Narrow wheel base, narrow wheel span. Good and difficult terrain. Can go up a 45 to 50 degree grade. Weight distribution is 50-50. There are no factory-made tractors that can do what I expect from a machine. It was about a half year of work. What do you think? How come they got such a small hat? They got such a small hat? Yeah. Big hat or... <laughs> I think you answered the question there yourself. <laughs> now... Uh, anybody who wants to um, take a look, we, we had uh, all this in a way, you're welcome to stick around and take a look at the tractors here. I'll pull the screen down and we can uh, wander around and take a little more look at the tractors. But I wasn't. Um, the artist's name is Wukasz Skopski. He's a Polish photographer who... Uh, hey, Those ones are like bars are cheap. They're not going to buy them. They'll capture something that they can figure out a way to do it themselves.
So when you think about it, these guys do it a lot on pretty small pieces of land. The Bonaldo is a very hilly region. It's broken up with the OG. There are a lot of land. Lots of strikers, lots of OD. And you 